Today I wanna to go over the top seven mistakes I've seen when it comes to wires and cables in mobile power systems. These are mistakes I've made and these are mistakes that my consulting clients have made. They go from just annoying to things that are going to completely shut down your system. So without further ado, the number one mistake is actually using the wrong cable type. I made this mistake early on and I used this solid core Romex in general, for mobile applications, you're gonna use a stranded cable and that gives it greater fle flexibility because if you use a solid core conductor, it's going to vibrate and get loose where it makes a connection within the system and loose connections are going to get hot and potentially catch on fire. So you need something flexible that's going to take that vibration. So Romex is definitely out. Another one that you want to avoid using typically is gonna be the SOOW cable. This is a portable power cord and it is used for generators or welding machines and it's made to run through the open air. I've seen a few people actually install those inside the walls in RVs and they're widely available. You can order those on Amazon. They have a black jacket. They're very robust and they're made to be dragged around on the ground but they're not rated for permanent installations. So what you wanna use is a triplex marine cable. This is kind of a giant example. This is a six gauge three conductor. The triplex marine cable is typically gonna have a 105 degree Celsius jacket in comparison to the other cables which might have 90 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Celsius. So what that means is it's going to carry more current for the same size conductor before it heats up or potentially catches on fire. So you can put more current through this. It has the stranded conductors, so it's very flexible. It's frankly a lot easier to use than the solid core conductors. I think I've been kind of spoiled by this. <laughs> it's just a lot easier to install and snake around where you need to snake it around. The marine cable also has the 10 plated conductors, so the strands are plated with 10, and that is going to increase the corrosion resistance, especially if you're on the ocean or near the ocean, or if you're just in a high humidity environment, your van or RV is in storage. It's going to prevent that corrosion. Just like a loose connection, a corroded connection will also heat up and potentially catch things on fire as well. So go for that triplex marine cable and uh, also the duplex marine cable would be for your 12 volt side of your circuitry. So that's mistake number one, using the wrong cable type. Mistake number two is going to be creating confusion with the wire colors. So my pet peeve, I've seen people, they don't wanna buy a red and a black cable for their main uh, DC conductors. So they'll buy all black and then they'll put red heat shrink on the cable for the positive conductors. And uh, this kind of works. It, look, it looks super amateur and it may hurt you on the resale value. It's basically screaming that a professional did not build this. <laughs> um, but if you get a system where you have lots of conductors installed and you can't necessarily see the end of the cables, it can just be really confused confusing and uh, I find that people cut corners and it ends up being confusing when you come back and try to troubleshoot the system. Another place I've seen this is I installed an electric awning at a van shop and I remember there was a cable that I needed or a wire I needed to extend. It was purple with a white stripe and we didn't have that on hand and nobody wanted to wait to order it but the problem was, is it was going in the wall as a purple with the white stripe and it was coming out the wall at the control panel somewhere else. And the tendency is to grab an orange wire or a blue or something you have on hand. Maybe you're not using it anywhere else in that system, but it just cre uh, wreaks havoc when somebody comes back and tries to troubleshoot that system. So in general, if you have a wire that's purple with a white stripe and you need to extend it, it's going inside the wall and emerging somewhere else, go ahead and order that cable. Do it right because two years later, it could be a nightmare when somebody's <laughs> trying to match up those wires and they don't correlate. So that's mistake number two, creating confusion with the wire colors. There's no difference between these conductors. They're all copper on the inside. So we, re we are really relying on those colors to tell us what that wire is doing. So don't mess around with that, I would say. 
Now, if you're interested in your overall power system, not just doing your cabling right, but things like batteries and charging sources, I have a resource that you may be interested in called the Ultimate Van Power Cheat Sheet. It's got a discussion of the three major charging sources you're gonna find in vans and RVs. Those are solar, shore, and alternator power. It's gonna talk about how they all have strengths, but they also have times where they are kind of weak and don't deliver. But when you bring them together in a holistic power strategy, it's gonna make sure that you're covered no matter where you go out on the road. So you can enjoy what you went out there to do and you're not gonna be worried about your power system. There's also a discussion about different battery types and the strengths and weaknesses of those. That's gonna help you narrow in on which battery type is gonna be right for you. And then lastly, there is a whole diagram that's gonna show your whole system, kinda of like you see here. It's gonna show how those charging sources at the top connect through the system, come out and charge your battery bank and how that power gets distributed to your end devices, such as your electric stoves or your microwave. So all of this is included in the Ultimate Van Power Cheat Sheet. All you have to do to grab your own copy is click that link below or go to rosslukeman.com slash vanpower. All right, let's roll on to mistake number three. The cables are not tightened to specification and never checked after the initial install. So one of the things that you can do is go ahead and get a torque wrench to tighten your connections to the proper torque. A lot of this equipment is going to have the torque they want you to, want you to use in the manual. Quite frankly, this, when I tighten these down to the torque spec that they asked for, it's a little bit less than I would typically do if I used a regular ratchet, which frankly I used for many years. <laughs> I just uh, used a, a ratchet and I got everything snug. So this is not going to make your connections super snug. The danger of overdoing it is things can deflect and the metal can actually bend if you over tighten it or in a worst case scenario, you'll actually snap the bolt off. So if you can, Torque it down to the correct torque spec. And in general, you are going to wanna to watch those loose connections. So other than torquing everything down, just come back at the end and check all of your bolts, especially if there are other people around while you're doing your installation. You could have been distracted and you, if you miss one bolt and a high current goes through that loose connection, it can get hot and potentially cause a fire. So it's not a huge deal. Just go back, check each bolt, torque it down to, to the torque spec if you have this. And the other thing I've noticed is I've actually turned the system on and let everything run at full current. And connections that I swore I tightened the day before, I would come back, the system would heat up and get hot and then it would cool down and I would have a loose connection the next day. And this occurred with the Orion. I uh, ran a system and I came back and that, that screw terminal was loose. So when things heat up and cool down, sometimes it's, it's good to re-tighten. So in general, like I said, with the solid conductors, they create those loose connections and then you can have heat and fire. Um, loose connections in general, just watch out for them. It's a very easy thing to avoid torque it down to the correct specification, check it at the end of your install, run the system for a couple days or a week, come back and re-tighten everything. Loose connections is something easy to eliminate that can cause big problems if not fixed. And uh, let's see, I've got my little list down here. Mistake number four is incorrect cable lengths. And this is something that I learned the hard way you have that vibration, right, in the mobile power systems. And you can see that this cable here is the exact length that it needs to be. And it works in a building, but in a mobile application, you have that vibration and you have things moving. These things are bolted to the same wall, so it's not quite as bad. But I had one case where I installed a second alternator and the fuse for that alternator was on the frame of the vehicle. The alternator was on the engine. It was a Sprinter van. So the engine and the alternator, the engine block are shaking and the, 
the frame of the vehicle is not shaking quite as much. They're, they're separate. And I created a short, stout cable that basically had no flex. It was a direct line. Everything looked fine when the vehicle was off, but when the, when the vehicle turned on, the vibra vibration was very apparent, and I was basically creating a scenario where that bolt, that those two bolts connecting that cable were going to loosen up over time. So I like to make everything as short as possible. It looks very clean. As you can see here, everything is, is straight and orthogonal to the best of my ability, but sometimes you need to put a little bit of length in that cable so it has that flex because it's connecting two different components that aren't bolted to the same wall or the same armature and sometimes they're moving and you need a little bit of flex. So we have to remember that movement in the mobile power systems. It's not a building. Maybe it looks like a building when you're installing it. Everything is, is sitting still, but going down the road, everything's bouncing around. And so you need to provide for some flexibility in the system. Now, the other side of that is making cables or ordering cables that are way too long and you have sloppy lengths. In general, I would say make your cables. You can get some very economical cable cutters. And if you don't want to get a, an expensive hydraulic crimper, you can use the hammer crimper. And if you don't want to hit it with a hammer, you could even put it in a vise and you can have kind of a hydraulic motion to make those crimps. But in general, I would make your cables, make them as short as possible. But when you need to add a little bit of extra length for that vibration, go ahead and make them a little bit longer. So. If you make your own cables, you can choose the exact length that you think is appropriate. Hopefully those are a couple of anecdotes to tell you when to make it as short as possible and when to add a little bit of length. So number five is creating choke points with your cables. And I've seen this in a couple of places. So when it comes to the DC cabling, if you add a second or third battery to your battery bank, and you connect those cables. I spoke with a guy, he had some system shutdowns and what he had done is he had his main lines coming back to the batteries, but the, the links between the batteries were a smaller gauge. And in general, what I've done in this system is this particular device asked for a 400 amp fuse. And I actually have two 200 amp fuses there. It also asks you to split the line and have two lines positive, two lines negative. And so this is my largest device in this system. And so I need to pull 400 amps from the batteries. So I provided a cable that can provide that 400 amps. But what I've seen with some people is they will reduce the cable size to the next battery or the next couple of batteries and create a choke point. So if I need 400 amps from this battery, that cable thickness needs to go all the way to the end of the line because this machine, it doesn't care whether it's pulling from the first battery or the last battery. It needs to get that 400 amps from all the batteries. So don't create a choke point by using a skinny cable between your batteries use the same cable size as your main trunk line. If this is two aught, use two aught links. If this is four aught, use four aught links there. And the other place I've seen this is with this, these inverter chargers. People set them up to carry 30 amps for a 30 amp system. And sometimes they just grab a regular extension cord and plug in their van into the garage. And I've got a couple of cords here, but a lot of these extension cords are 16 gauge. And I think you could probably pull about 10 amps through this max. And these machines, you can dial them down to 15 amps. Maybe they're running at a full 30 amps. They're trying to pull 30 amps and you've got a cable that is made to put 10 amps into that machine. And if it's running any distance, the voltage drop will cause this machine to shut down with a low voltage shutdown. So in general, make sure if you're pulling 30 amps, you would use a 10 gauge cable. If you dial it down to 20 amps, you would use a 12 gauge three conductor like this extension cord. 
But in general, if you use a skinny extension cord, it's going to cause a mysterious shutdown, a low voltage shutdown in your system. So those are two scenarios where people have created some kind of shutdown by using a cable that was too skinny. All right. The number six mistake is either no overcurrent protection or a rating that's too high. So I have a terminal fuse on this battery that is 300 amps. What you want to do is have that be below the rating of the cable. So this cable will carry 445 amps. The fuse would typically be a 400 amp fuse. The terminal fuses max out at 300. I use what I had. So as long as the fuse is less than the cable, the cable will not catch on fire. So that's the same here. These cables are 285 amp rated and they have 200 amp fuses on them. And of course the fuses don't immediately blow. So this 300 amp fuse, I ran 340 amps through it in last week's video. So it will blow eventually, but you can go over the rating a little bit. So having those fuses be, let's say I had a 500 amp fuse here and the cables rated for 400 amps. If we have a short circuit situation, let's say this device short circuits, or let's say I touch these uh, black and red conductors together, create a short circuit, the cable is going to heat up and catch on fire before the fuse blows. So that fuse rating needs to always be below the rating of the cable. And then in general, people always say, where do I need cables and fuses? And the answer is everywhere. And just like a house, you wouldn't have any wires in your walls running to outlets that weren't on some sort of breaker. So you have a main breaker coming into your house and that would be like the main fuse that when you leave the battery bank, that's your power source. You're going to have a fuse on that line and then you would have kind of a sub panel where you'd have branch lines going out. And we could think of that like this Lynx distributor. We have our main lines coming in and then each small line that goes out also has a fuse going on to some device. And you can see even the output of the MultiPlus, it has a breaker here. Now the MultiPlus can put out 55 amps. It will boost the grid power, which is a, a 30 amps for this model. It'll boost that by 25 amps, making a total of 55 amps. So I could put a 55 amp breaker here, but this cable is a 10 gauge three conductor it's only made to carry 30 amps. So that breaker on that cable has to be a maximum of 30 amps. If I put a 55 amp breaker here, basically this could overload and catch that cable on fire and the breaker would never trip. It would just keep providing power and everything would catch on fire. So bring the breaker down below the rating of the cable. 10 gauge cable is gonna be a 30 amp breaker. 12 gauge cable is gonna be a 20 amp breaker. 14 gauge cable is going to be a 15 amp breaker. And in general, I don't put 15 amp breakers in these mobile power systems anymore because people tend to plug things in all into one side of the vehicle. It tends to be on one breaker and I just put 20 amp breakers with 12 gauge cable for all of my branch lines. Now I have mistake number seven. Let's go ahead and uh, show the four gauge cable versus the four aught cable. And this is a mistake I've seen. And this comes to reading diagrams. If you haven't done these systems before, you see the diagram and it says four and you think four gauge. So four gauge is here. Four aught means four zeros or a quad zero gauge. And I know American wire gauge is confusing. The Europeans, they, they tell me we should measure everything in millimeters. I agree. But uh, for now, we're stuck with the American wire gauge and uh, four gauge is definitely not four aught. That will potentially cause a fire. If you need a four aught and you put a four gauge, this is 445 amps. I think this carries 160 amps. You're going to go way over what this cable is rated for if you use um, a four gauge in place of a four aught. People also make the mistake with two gauge and two aught. It's not as drastic of a difference, but again, you're using about half the copper and you're gonna cause a fire. 
And then I had one more bonus tip, tip number eight. So with the, we'll have to zoom in for this one. With your triplex cable and duplex cable, you're going to have a black on the triplex that is your hot for your 120 volt lines. And on your 12 volt duplex cable, your black is your negative. The red is the hot, so to speak. So you have two blacks and when you come into the breaker panel, oftentimes in the US, we're gonna have the 120 volt breakers right next to the 12 volt fuse block. So you have all these wires coming in and it can be confusing. One of them is black is hot, one of them black is negative. And uh, what you can do to get rid of the confusion, get your optimize your wire colors is you can use the safety duplex cable, which has the yellow for the negative on the 12 volt wiring, the 12 volt duplex. And so all of your wire colors are distinct and there's no confusion. So it's not imperative that you do this. The wire color mistakes I mentioned earlier are maybe more important than this. But in general, you want to have those wire colors be really accurate, really easy to read so you know what you're doing, you can troubleshoot easily, and you're not going to be mixing up colors. So those are my seven cable and wire mistakes that I've seen for mobile power systems. I hope that was really helpful. Thanks for watching. Again, if you want a copy of the Ultimate Van Power Cheat Sheet, all you have to do is click that link below or go to rosslukeman.com slash vanpower. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.